My dear students, let me welcome you to the general revision edition of physics. And this edition you'll be encountered with miscellaneous questions. The questions will be of gradual increasing difficulty. Hopefully you'll find them interesting and beneficial. So let's get started. What happens when a resistance of equal value to the fixed resistor is connected in parallel with it? Your attention, please. Here we've got, yes, a circuit in a state of resonance. Why it is in a state of resonance? Simply because XL is equal to XC. Inductive reactance is equal to 120 ohm. Yes, capacitive reactance is the same, it is 120 ohm. So we are in a state of resonance, okay? But when a resistor is connected in parallel to R, yes, total resistance, equivalent resistance decreases and current increases. But a state of resonance will be unchanged. So the circuit remains a resonance state, but the current flowing in the circuit increases because the resistance decreases. What happens when the value of the variable resistance is increased? Also, this will not alter the state of resonance, but increasing the variable resistance will decrease the current. So the circuit remains a resonance state, but the current flowing in the circuit decreases. What happens? AC supply, okay, is replaced with the DC supply. If AC supply is replaced with DC supply, the capacitor will get it charged, okay, and Okay, quickly the current drops to zero. So the answer is the capacitor is charged, then the current quickly drops to zero. The following diagram, we've got another sort of questions, represents helium neon laser. Okay. What is the value of the pressure inside the tube? It asks about the value of the pressure inside the tube. Of course, it's all easy. It is 0.6 millimeter Hg. What is the lasing medium in the device? In helium, neon, gas laser. What is the medium which gives us the light, the laser light we want? It is neon, of course, neon atoms. How is pumping accomplished in this laser? Okay, this could be accomplished by using high radio frequency waves or high DC voltage. Why is it important that the metastable state in a helium atom has a close value to that in a neon atom? Okay, this is a very important question. Since the metastables of helium and neon are of very close values, so when a metastable helium atom and, and a ground state neon atom collide, the excitation energy of the helium atom can be transferred to the neon atom. Okay? So when a metastable helium atom collides with a ground state neon atom, what happens? Excitation energy is transferred from helium to neon atom. In this way, a population inversion situation of neon atoms is obtained. Also, talking about the same question, it is about helium neon laser. What happens if the two mirrors were removed? 
the two mirrors, okay, were removed. As a matter of fact, we won't be able to obtain laser light. The device cannot produce laser because the two mirrors are responsible for light amplification. And let me remind you with something here. The mirror with the lower coefficient of reflection enable laser light to emerge from the device, okay? Also, what happens if that you didn't contain helium atoms? Okay, this is very interesting also. Neon atoms, which, is, which are the lasing medium, could not be excited in their metastable state. Couldn't be, yes, driven into, yes, metastable state. They couldn't be driven into a situation of population inversion. Thus, the device would not be able to produce laser light. Now we've got another type of questions. We've got a diagram. The figure shows an excited atom already found in A2. Okay, and what about the question? Mention the different possible methods by which the atom may relax to the ground state. Okay, then mention three of the differences between the types of emission produced when the atom relaxes. Okay, first of all, the excited electron or excited atom, okay, relaxes to the ground state after its lifetime is over and spontaneous emission occurs. This is the first possibility. Also, we've got another possibility the excited electron is stimulated, is driven to relax to the ground state before its life li time is over. If a stimulating photon, okay, photon have an energy equal to the difference between E2 and E1, passes by the atom and a stimulated emission takes place. And now talking about the differences between spontaneous and stimulated emission. Photons emitted by spontaneous emission have a wide range of wavelengths, so we call it polychromatic. Photons emitted by stimulated emission are monochromatic. They are of just one wavelength, of single wavelength. Another point of difference. Photons emitted by spontaneous emission propagate randomly in all directions. Okay, they are divergent. But photons emitted by stimulated emission are coherent and propagate in one direction as collimated parallel B. Spontaneous emission is not triggered, is not caused by external influence. Okay, but the stimulated emission is triggered by external influence. The light emitted by spontaneous emission obeys the inverse square law. The intensity okay, of the light emitted by stimulated emission does not obey the inverse square law. Spontaneous emission is the dominant radiation in ordinary light sources, but stimulated it is the dominant in laser sources. And now we've got another important question. It is about X-rays. The diagram shows an apparatus for the production of X-rays used for producing X-rays. Show how the electrons are produced and suggest how they could be accelerated to the target. 
Okay, we'll take it one by one. Electrons are produced when a current is sent through the cathode. Okay. And what about accelerating the emitted electrons? Electrons are accelerated by applying high voltage between the cathode and the anode. Another item on the same question. How may the penetrating power, penetration power of X-rays be changed, be varied? How can we change it? Okay, by varying the accelerating voltage applied between the cathode and the anode. For example, increasing the accelerating voltage, increasing the potential difference between the anode and the cathode, increases the velocity of the electrons is striking the anode. We call them bombarding electrons. And this increases the frequency of the emitted photons, photons of X-rays emitted. So the penetration power of X-rays produced increases. Another item on the same question, how may the intensity of X-rays, intensity, not penetration power, be changed, be varied? Okay, intensity of X-rays can be changed, can be varied by changing the current flowing through the cathode. Increasing the current, increasing the cathode current raises its temperature, which in turn increases the number of electrons emitted from the cathode. And as a result, the intensity of the produced X-rays increases. Okay, another item. Why is it necessary to use a vacuum tube? In other words, why the tube should be evacuated? Okay. If the tube weren't evacuated, the electrons emitted from the cathode would collide with the, yes, gas found inside the tube, and instead of colliding with the target, an X-rays would not be produced. That is to say, by evacuating the tube, the resistance encountered by the bombarding electrons is decreased. So evacuating decreases the resistance. What about the use of the copper block in the tube? Okay. During operation, during operation of the device, the temperature of the target, tungsten target, highly, yes, rises. The high heat conduction of copper improves the dissipation of heat. So we need to get rid of the heat produced. So we use copper because it is simply a good conductor of heat. So it dissipates the produced heat to the surroundings. What would happen if the target, and this is very important item, if the target in the tube was replaced with another target having greater atomic number? This will affect, yes, line spectrum of X-rays. When replacing the target, line spectrum will be changed. And now we are replacing it with another one having greater atomic number. So X-ray line spectrum is changed. It would consist of shorter wavelengths. Okay. Another type of question, the following figure represents the intensity distribution of the spectrum produced by X-ray tube. Okay. Why are the sharp peaks on the diagram characteristic of the target? Sharp peaks actually, yes, are the line spectrum. So why they are characteristic of the target material. Line spectrum is produced when the bombarding electrons have enough energy to 
we remove electrons from the inner shells of the atoms of the target. And what happens next? Okay, then electrons from outer higher energy levels drop to fill the holes, producing a set, a group of distinct frequencies. Okay, another question, another important question. What is the relation used for calculating the wavelength of a characteristic line of X-rays? We want the relation used for calculating the wavelength of a line spectrum. Okay, the difference in energy levels equals E2 minus E1, and it is equal to H nu. And nu, of course, could be replaced by C over lambda. In this way, we can calculate the wavelength lambda. And how are the photons having the minimum wavelength in X-ray continuous spectrum produced? Okay. They are produced, the minimum wavelength in the continuous spectrum is produced when a bombarding electron is stopped by just one collision. Is stopped by just one collision. And all its energy is converted into a photon. Energy gained by the electron in the electric field is EV. Okay, the electron loses all its energy into a, a photon having, yes, energy H nu, H nu maximum. And nu maximum could be replaced by C over lambda minimum. Another type of questions, okay. In front of you, we've got a diagram, okay. A student disconnects the voltmeter in the circuit, removes the voltmeter, and connects in its place a battery and a switch. So the voltmeter is replaced by a battery and a switch. Okay, so we expect to form a motor. But when he closes the switch, the coil does not rotate as it should in a DC motor. What is the reason for this? Okay, what is the problem here? As a matter of fact, we've got two rings, so the coil will not rotate in one direction. It reverses the direction of its rotation twice a cycle. Because the two rings always direct the current to flow in the coil in the same direction. <laughs>
theta equals zero, sine zero equals zero. So any instantaneous MF is equal to zero because theta equals zero and sine zero is zero. When does the force of a magnetic field on a current carrying wire equal zero? Force of a magnetic field on a wire placed in the field and carrying current. The wire carries current and placed in a field, but no force acts on it. Okay, so the wire is placed parallel to the field. Force is calculated, is given from the relation BIL sine theta. Force equals zero also when theta equals zero. When does the difference between MF of a cell and its terminal voltage equal zero? In other words, when does the terminal voltage of a cell is equal to MF of the cell? It happens in two cases. When the circuit of the cell is open, that's to say the resistance across the terminals of the cell is infinite. No current passes through the cell. Or when the internal resistance of the cell is neglected. R is equal to zero. Okay, so yes, terminal voltage will be equal to MF of the cell, so the difference will be zero. When does the average EMF induced in a coil that rotates in a magnetic field equal zero. It happens when the coil completes one cycle or when it completes half cycle starting from the horizontal position. When does the magnetic flux density at the midpoint between two current carrying parallel wires equal zero? So we've got two wires carrying currents, and we want to calculate the total field at a point midway between them, and we found it to be equal to zero. This happens when, okay, when the two wires carry equal currents in the same direction. Okay, when does the current in the primary coil of a transformer, the Primary is connected to the mains, but the current is equal to zero. Okay, this happens when the secondary coil is un unloaded. So when the secondary circuit is open, secondary coil is unloaded, what happens? No current passes through the secondary coil. It is quite clear because it is a broken circuit. But in the primary, a backward EMF is induced, which is nearly equal to that of the supply, so no current passes in the primary also. When does the electric conductivity of a pure silicon crystal equal zero? Okay, it happens at the absolute zero. At this particular temperature, all the bonds in the crystal are intact, they are, yes, we don't have any free electrons. The bonds are intact. When does the mass of a photon or linear momentum of a photon equal zero? It happens when the photon comes to rest. When does the output of an end gate is zero? Okay, this happens. The output of an AND gate is zero when either or all inputs of the gate is equal to zero. Okay. When does the kinetic energy of the electrons extracted from the surface of a metal by electromagnetic radiation equal zero? Okay, it happens when the frequency of the incident radiation exactly equal to the threshold frequency of the metal. So the radiation is capable of extracting electrons, but kinetic energy of the electrons is then zero. Third type of questions, explain. 
the action of the diode resembles that of a switch. Action of a diode resembles that of a switch. As a matter of fact, the simply because the diode has a small resistance when it is forward biased and very high resistance when it is reverse biased. When it is forward biased, it resembles a switch, but closed the switch. When it is reverse biased, it, is, it acts like a switch, but open a switch. Explain. The transistor can be used as a binary device. Why we can use the transistor as a binary device? Since a transistor circuit can have two states, yes, on and off, so it can be used as a binary device. A binary device is a digital system based on only two digits. The digits are 0 and 1. Explain. At very low frequencies, the AC circuit that contains a capacitor is considered as an open circuit. Is considered open circuit means no current flows at very high frequencies in the circuit that contains a capacitor. Okay, it is to do with the capacitive reactance. What about the capacitive reactance? It is equal to 1 over 2 pi Fc. So when the frequency increases, what happens to the reactance? The reactance is decreased. OK, at very high frequencies, at very high frequencies, so we can say the capacitive reactance increases when the frequency is decreased and almost no current flows in the circuit. In this way, we've come to the end of the edition. Thank you for watching. All the best and goodbye.